Hey, it's Tommy Allen for TommyAllenMusic.com. Welcome. This week we have the guitarist Sam Whiting. Come check it out. Thank you very much for joining us today. No, at all. Thanks for having me. I've done a little bit of research. Did my best anyway. So we, we start Uh-oh. with it's, uh, www.stewmusic.co.uk. That's right. STW Music. What's your earliest childhood musical memory? Oh, man. I come from quite a musical family. My mum plays piano. Um, and I think... <laughs> I think my earliest musical memory was wanting to play sax because of Lisa Simpson. Oh, okay. The bar- so I got, yeah, I got quite into um, The Simpsons, as you do, and I just loved all the episodes where Lisa would be playing sax. So I think I must have been eight or nine years old, and I wanted to play sax. So for several years, I was kind of learning that as my main instrument, and that, was, that kind of set me on the path, really, because I was terrible in school. I was a bit of a nightmare, um, and it kind of gave me that thing that I could focus on, and I really enjoyed what did your mum play? What sort of music? So she plays piano. She's completely the polar opposite musician to me. Like I'm, I really like the improvising side of stuff, blues, rock, fusion, big mixture of things. I like kind of flying by the seat of my pants. Um, my mum will sit down and she will learn a piece by reading it and then she'll perform it and then she'll move on to the next one and she'll sight read that. I, I enjoy sight reading, but I don't consider it a massive part of my tool set. So she's like the polar opposite. She will sit down and she'll perfectly sight read a classical piece on piano. Um, and I just like, I ended up being like, I want to play rock, mum. So it was a bit different. But yeah, she's a very broad musician, but very different to me. And do you have any brothers or sisters? Got a brother. He plays a bit of drums. Okay. Older or younger? He's younger. He's four years younger than me. Uh, We used to be in a band together, which was, turns out, not a great idea. (laughs) What year was you born? I was born in 1989. When did you pick up the guitar? What age was you? I must have been... 13, 14, I think, when I picked up guitar. Um, I remember going to see We Will Rock You, and I was still playing sax at the time, um, and I was getting a little bit fed up with it because, obviously, I was it's quite a jazz-slash-classical kind of route for a lot of sax players. Um, and I felt I was doing a lot of the exams and the grades. I didn't feel like I had much autonomy over what I was learning. When I went to see We Will Rock You and I saw all these guys just playing one chord ridiculously loud, I was like, that's the one. This is it for me. I actually started learning guitar twice because um, the first time my mum gave, she used to play guitar. She gave me her old nylon string guitar um, and I sucked at it, of course. Every, you know, you always do. And I was like, nah, this isn't for me. I was learning like Wheels on the Bus from an old book that my mum gave me and I was just like, this isn't, there's definitely a distance between this and what Brian May was doing. <laughs> like, I'm not quite sure this is the path for me. Um, and I think it was when I started to get into more music as I became a teenager and, you know, entered that rebellious rock and roll phase where I sort of think, no, actually, I really want to get into the more rock side of things. Um, and like yourself, I started with all the blues rock kind of stuff. And that's what I really enjoyed. Um, and that made my dad happy because he's always been into, like, you know, Pink Floyd, Hendrix, Queen, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so then my parents decided for one Christmas, well, we'll try and do it properly then, but you've got to, you know, you have to be sure because this is a big deal. And I got a Yamaha Pacifica for one Christmas with a little, you know, one and a half watt amp or something. Um, and loved it. And ever since then, I've played every day. And I don't know what it was about that second time. I think I've always gravitated towards the electric guitar um, and that slightly more rock kind of vibe. And what happened with school at that point? Um, not a lot. <laughs> um, I wasn't that bad. I was all right in school. I just sort of got distracted by guitar to the extent that I did quite well in music and did all right and everything else. You know, you had yeah, B's and C's, that sort of thing. Not a terrible student, but wasn't that bothered. <laughs> and, what, and what did you go on to do after school? I went straight to the Academy of Contemporary Music after school when I was 16, 17. Um, and so then I did a diploma, a higher diploma, and then my degree uh, in Guildford at the ACM. Um, and that was, God, that was in 2009. Um, which is terrifying now, but um, to this day, I still work with all the guys I met uh, in ACM. It was a good move. What was it like there, your experience? 
I loved it. Um, we were essentially being taught by guys that were out in the industry playing in great bands. They're all fantastic musicians. Guys like Giorgio Cerchi, uh, Matt Hasler, Pete Roth, um, you know, real industry professionals. So as a little dorky guy with long curly hair, I was just like, how does it work? Like, how do you get a gig? What, what, how, you know, I played live a bit before with like a school band and all this stuff, but these guys, it was their day to day. So it was a huge difference between what they were doing and what they were teaching versus, you know, sitting at home. This is kind of before YouTube as well. So I'd be sat at home. I had a great teacher when I was a teenager. He was fantastic. But I was sat at home by myself when I went to ACM just practicing scales. And it was when these teachers started to introduce what you do with scales that make them that much more interesting and useful and making them musical. Um, so the teaching was great there. Um, you're just immersed in music and you're surrounded by other students that are like, oh, check out this guy. I just heard of him yesterday. And, you know, I discovered Tommy Emanuel. Uh, everyone. Just like, I came in there thinking like, Slash is like my guy. Absolutely loved Guns N' Roses at the time. And I came out just being like, yeah, man, Jamiroquai, Tom Quayle, Guthrie Govan, like all these guys I've been introduced to. Um, it was crazy. Just like too much to process for years and years afterwards. How do you think the guitar is going to change then in the future? Um, we were speaking about this a minute ago, really. I think regarding the modelling and versus analog. Um, I honestly, I can't say. I, people are starting to freak me out with the amount of times I'm seeing like fan frets and stuff right. on guitars, and like they seem to be gathering more and more strings as well as time goes on. Um, I think like any instrument, the guitar is quite young, really, compared to say piano, etc. So I think there's probably a lot of wiggle room in there. But I do think we're on the maybe the precipice of this analog and digital thing, either really splitting off or maybe coming together. And like we're seeing stuff like companies like Two Notes putting their uh, profiling, not profiling, but um, IR technology into real amps. So I think in terms of how we record and how we hear guitars, that's going to change and keep evolving. But you've got to wonder what's going to happen to guitar playing as well. Like I certainly don't know. It's changed so much even in my lifetime. What about, because I saw one of your little videos you did with the MIDI sounds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you use any of that live? Yeah. Uh, is it some of this stuff? Hang on, let me find your screen again. Yeah. That sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know why, but I just love that sort of stuff. I'm, I'm really into my synth wave and like all the retro wave stuff. My, one of my fav probably my favorite band right now is a band called The Midnight, who do a lot of this retro wave synth-based music. And it's weird being a guitarist and then realizing in your late 20s that you want to play synth. Um, but I can do it because of, <laughs> because of technology. Um, I use it live as much as I possibly can without getting fired. Right, OK. How do you pick up the so, mi MIDI on the guitar? Has it got one of the MIDI pickups? No, so um, this is I'm going into an Axe FX3 to record at the moment, and it has a synth kind of block, like a synth setting you can turn on. So the normal amp that I was using is a uh, Morgan AC20, and all I've done is I've put a synth block in front of it. And you get that sound as opposed to this one, which is the slightly more traditional kind of guitar amp. Right, okay, so would that write down as MIDI on the door? No, that would be audio, audio, which is really yeah, weird. Okay. okay. Yeah. Right. So it's all coming out of the Axe FX as audio. I think you can send uh, MIDI signals from the Axe FX, but it's not sending MIDI music. So I'm not using MIDI for that. It's really weird because obviously you'd expect that sound to be MIDI. Um, so it's crazy. You can do it live without having to have loads of MIDI controllers and all that sort of stuff going on. Can you remember your first solo you picked out? Ah, oh, it was definitely Smells Like Teen Spirit. I remember. Uh, sorry. Can you remember it? Probably not. That's it, isn't it? Probably Kurt Cobain spinning in his grave. It's a bit too yazzy. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the, I remember that. I just said, Sorry, go uh, on. the other day someone said Kurt Cobain was into um, uh, ABBA. No way. Yeah, it was, it was something that <laughs> came, on, something came on the radio in the tour bus. They had like a disco ball and he used to sing one of the songs. <laughs> Brilliant. I mean, he's only human. Exactly. <laughs> Can't resist ABBA. I remember learning that solo, actually. Um, 
because you know when I discovered guitar, I was a right nerd. I'd be sat in my bedroom for hours at a time, just like trying to figure all this stuff out, learning how to read tab, because I'd learned how to read notation from learning sax. But like then tab was like this mystery to me. I was like the wrong way around because I was trying to read notation, but there wasn't that much notation on the internet. And this was the early days of like um, ultimateguitar.com and stuff like that. So you'd find these rubbish tabs that were transcribed by you know nine-year-olds that only been playing one day longer than you had. Um, and some of it was right, some of it was wrong, and I think that helped with the whole ear training thing as well, because there's a lot of hit and miss, trial and error. And I remember one of my neighbors coming up and being like, oh, it's sounding pretty good, because they were visiting my family. And I was like, well, hey, the mark of approval. God knows if he knew what I was trying to play, or if he's just being nice. But um, either way, that was a big confidence boost when someone actually said, yeah, that doesn't sound rubbish. How would you describe yourself in your music? Um, You've got an elevator pitch. Sorry? An elevator pitch where you get in with oh. someone and you've got like a two floors to explain your music to someone. Whenever someone asks me that, I do panic and I always end up saying I would describe my approach to the guitar as wank. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I struggle. I think that I'm so into the synth stuff, but obviously I, you get such, it's so rare that I get an opportunity to use that stuff outside of my own recordings on YouTube and so on. Yeah, yeah. And I write music so rarely because I'm so busy with lessons and function gigs and working with people in that way and recording other people's music. That I don't know. I do have a real struggle with my identity. Like, without wanting to sound like too much of a crisis on your hands, um, it's I do struggle. I think that it's that combination of fusion, but I'm and jazz, but with like country. But I started off as like a rock guy, <laughs> so it's been a real weird path through everything for me. And I think it's still changing. What guitar music gets you excited? Um. Most of it. At the moment, I'm listening to a lot of like Ariel Poston and the uh, uh, Brothers Landreth, guys like that, where it's woven into really great songwriting. And I've found that over the years, I've gone from listening to, you know, exclusive guitar shred, absorbed as much of that as I could. And these days, I'll appreciate, oh, that's a really nice chord voicing, or the way that they've dynamically picked that line is really cool, rather than being like, wow, he played 12 notes in half a second, that's cool. I'll be like, he played 12 notes in this whole song. That's cool. <laughs> How often do you look for new artists to listen to? Not anywhere near often enough. I often stumble across music by accident, I find, which is probably a nice organic way of doing it, but I think I'd like to have more conversations with fellow musicians about, you know, what we've been listening to. We never, we, no one ever has that question. Everyone's like, hey man, yeah, cool, gig, let's go. And I think there's that element of being jaded, which I, love, I try to avoid as much as I possibly can, because music is awesome, obviously. Um, but I need to work on that. I need to work on seeing more humans in general. I think you're the first human contact I've had in about four months with the <laughs> lockdown and everything. So thank you for that. That's a pleasure, man. <laughs> so you on Spotify and all that stuff? My guitar playing is on Spotify, but I don't have a Spotify um, playlist as such. I play guitar for an artist called Emma Stevens. Um, and she's releasing a new album soon. Um, and I've played guitar on a lot of her albums in the past as well. Um, so that's quite cool. It's nice to kind of hear the occasional guitar solo at the back end of a song and so on. Um, so that's been a really good outlet. So that's kept me a little bit busy throughout the early part of lockdown, doing some recording for that. Um, and her new album is sounding cool. So I'm looking forward to that as well. And that's going to be on Spotify. Yes. So Emma Stevens, Stevens with a V. Um, and that's... I believe that new album is dropping soon. I think she's just released a single from it as in like the last few days. Um, and that's kind of, that's another different direction. That's like pop, like pop, folk, country. She's got all, she's a multi-instrumentalist. She plays all sorts of different instruments. And so kind of fitting in with the electric guitar in there has been really cool. You got any riffs that you played on, not the new stuff, but any of the old stuff you've done with her? Um, oh God, there's loads. So the thing I love about playing guitar for Emma is uh, it's a lot of um, this stuff where you get the... Uh, There's all the kind of ambient kind of stuff as well, which is really nice. It's she refers to my guitar playing as adding the sparkle, which is which is great for me because I haven't got to do any of the hard work. So a lot of the time, you know, if she's playing an A chord, my job is to go, ah, okay, I see your A chord, and I raise you some spangly, pretty version of that chord. So what did you do there then? Amazing. What is that called? So, then? so that chord. Good question. I'd probably call that like an A, an A add 11, or an A sus 4, depending on how much of a nerd you want to be. And why would you um, want to play that over an A chord? Well, that's the thing. I might get told off. 
but it's all about kind of the interesting about Emma. We've known each other for years. We actually met at ACM. Um, so again, you know, a lot of work I've got on has come out of studying with people at ACM. Um, and Emma will be holding down the chord progression on her acoustic guitar. She plays a ukulele. She plays banjo. Um, so it could be anything. And depending on what the kind of dynamic of the song is, I'll have to react in a certain way. So if it's like a mega ballad, I might get away with that. And then, you know, some really fruity stuff there. But a lot of the time, it won't be that. It will be, you know... And it's just adding that top layer, which is great for me because you really have to then think, you know, like your question about why on earth would you play that and like how does that work and that's kind of what I've got to think on sometimes on the fly. But where's um, your brain thinking to go from an A chord to going to that chord? What was you thinking in your head? So the way I try and organise that stuff, especially if I've been given an opportunity to be paid for playing pretty chords, is like, right, this has got to be the prettiest chord in the world, but I've also got to have a backup amount of knowledge as to like, what if we just want something more sensible? Um, so if she's playing an A chord, uh, you know, a nice normal A major for sensible people, I'll have to think, where are we in the key? If we're in A, that's, you know, the one chord, that's the big important chord in the key of A, if it's A in A. And so I'll have to think, well, what notes would work with that? Which notes are going to be kind of safe? I might play the root note of A, I might play the fifth, I might play the major third. That's what makes up a major, an A major chord. But then I might think, well, what if I add some of the more unusual notes from the scale? And you can end up with some really interesting stuff. And it's finding, with any artist, with any individual, with any human, everyone has that different threshold of how much tension they like in their music. And because Emma is predominantly a pop writer with lots of hints of folk and country and all sorts of other stuff, she's got some outright, like, country banging tunes, but then it will go to, like, you know, an emotional ballad. So it depends on the artist, who you're playing with, is there keys, because they're probably going to hog all the uh, interesting chords if, if there's a keys player in there. <laughs> the battle rages on between guitarists and keyboards. Um, and then it's also sort of, what did we write in the studio? Emma's cool to work with because we communicate really well together having known each other for years, so she'll literally sing stuff at me. She'll like, no, no, not that note. I want... And I've got to try and think of, oh, okay. Cool, there it is. How do I add that into an A? So I'm, I'm down here and I've got to think, uh, maybe trying to find those noises. Um, and so I think a lot of people think that when you're in the studio and when you're writing for artists, it's like this. You sit down, you push record, and you just record it first take. Congratulations, you're amazing at your job. But I think there's actually so much communication that goes on when you're writing music and when you're writing with someone else on their music because it's their baby. Um, and so that led me into this weird new part of music which... Uh, I didn't see myself going to when I was in ACM and I started writing with Emma I was still in that rock phase and so taking someone whose favorite guitarist is Slash and saying I'm writing a pop tune in the key of C and it's got three chords in it we need to make it sound as cool as possible was that was like a real challenge stylistically and so I think I picked up a lot of stuff from that I hope some of that made sense I could talk for hours <laughs> about that stuff if you had three wishes what would you wish for uh <laughs> I would wish to not be diabetic, because that slows me right down. That's God's way of nerfing me, basically. He's trying to slow me down. Um, I think I'd wish that I'd started playing guitar a bit younger, um, just because I, I, I maybe this isn't a certain thing, but I wonder, would I be where I am now five years earlier? And how much would that help me get around you know, my playing? And then, oh man... I, you know, just like tons of money, I guess. So I don't have to worry about doing anything I don't want to. I can just play guitar all day and bum around. What's your go-to two pedals? Oh, man. Um, I really like the Dual Fusion from Warmpler because I find that that's a really good all-in-one solution. And I'm a big fan of Tom Quayle's playing. Um, I've been lucky enough to meet him and jam with him a couple of times. And, you know, I always take away... His tone is ridiculous. He's such a knowledgeable guy. And that's the closest you can kind of get to his tone legally by buying his signature Warmpler pedal. Um, and then I think it's got to be something, oh, maybe like the flashback delay. I loved, from TC Electronic, I loved kind of making my own delay algorithm in their uh, app and putting it onto this little, I've got the TC Mini, 
the Flashback Mini, and that comes with me on loads of pedal boards, especially when I'm doing like a small fly gig. I'll have, you know, maybe a HX Stomp or something, and I'll have, I mean, if that counts, HX Stomp is a good shout as well, because it's got everything in it. Um, but if I had to stick to, you know, single-use pedals, uh, the Wampler Dual Fusion and the Flashback Mini Delay, both are great pedals. What advice would you give to a younger you? Oh, man. Um, try to work on your time management. <laughs> I think one of my biggest pitfalls was I practiced loads when I was very young. So I got a lot of the actual you know, technique stuff down, but I would wake up, play guitar for ages, you know, sort out maybe school or whatever else. And I think I just coasted slightly on the fact that I had all the time in the world when you're that age. But when you go into ACM or uni and you start studying music and then you are trying to work as a musician, which is obviously extremely competitive, I think practice becomes a bit of a luxury. So I do often think if I had, to, if I could tell myself, make the most of your practice, practice stuff you don't know. Because I was very guilty of kind of, you know, when I was 13, I learned the, the glory of the A minor pentatonic scale. And I then proceeded to play that non-stop for six years because it sounded cool. But what I should have been looking at was like, maybe what else can you do with it? Learn, learn more about the fretboard, learn more about intervals and maybe some theory stuff. That's what fascinates me now. But then you've also got to wonder, I think if I met myself when I was young, I probably would have thought I was an absolute douchebag. So would I have listened? Probably not. <laughs> if you could go back in time and experience something again, what would it be? Oh, I think I would probably go back and do this one particular gig I got. Um, speaking of flying by the seat of your pants, uh, I hadn't been out of ACM that long, and I, me and a function band that had just formed, we literally had been, right, we're a band, we need to start getting gigs. We had decided that that was the case for about you know a week. We were a brand new band, great musicians, guys I still know today, fantastic players, lovely guys. But we were offered just through sheer like luck, a cruise gig um, for three weeks, which is pretty short for a cruise gig. Most of them are like months and months. So we're like, yeah, man, we've got to do this. We've got to practice. We've got like one week to get an entire bunch of songs down. We're talking like 60 songs um, and then go on this. So we were all panicking, but we accepted the gig and it was great. And the reason it was great was that we were all really good friends and we could all rely on each other. And what ensued was just absolute chaos. The first gig was an absolute train wreck because we hadn't talked about which versions of the songs we were doing, how long we were going to play for. And when we got on the boat, we were told, oh, by the way, the first set out of four, you're going to do 40 minutes of jazz standards. And these were a bunch of like rock and pop musicians that had looked at you know sight reading and jazz through our studies, but we weren't jazz musicians. And so we were like, oh, okay, cool, man. Um, we'll do our best. And it was great because it was stuff that we were learning as we were doing it. And while I would never claim to be a jazz musician in a million years, um, that really gave me a good experience. And it kind of made me realize that I enjoy that element of unpredictability, the sort of chaos, <laughs> trying to find order in the chaos. And I think that's kind of the, the improviser in me enjoys that. It also means I haven't actually got to sit down and really learn anything. I can just sort of try and get away with it as much as I can. And I, I loved it. It was a, a most amazing three weeks ever with you know, a great bunch of guys learning new stuff every day, we, every time we played. And we played for hours every day. So it was you know, proper practice time as well. Sometimes the whole place would be empty and we would just literally have a laugh. I had a, we had a competition of who could fit in the most theme tunes into the songs in the evening. And the other guitarist won with Top Gun. I was gutted. I should have thought of that one. So it was just fun. Just a really fun gig. What are you most proud of? Um, I th uh, that's a tough question. Instinctively, I kind of want to say being a JTC artist, but I feel like that might be a tad of a cop-out because I haven't released anything with JTC in far too long. I'm working on it. I've got a new idea kind of in the pipeline, but it's been at least a year, I think, since I released something. But that is an absolute badge of honor. You know, the guys that work in JTC are phenomenal. Both the musicians and all the guys that run the company are just amazing, fantastic guys. Um, so definitely worth checking them out. And my stuff on JTC is obviously available for lessons. And if you want to steal my licks, it's all up there. But also, 
as I've gotten older, I've gotten lots of really great feedback about teaching and lessons and my approach to stuff like that. And that means a lot because obviously I see people grow and benefit from the way I like to explain and think about things. And a lot of that is recycled from guys like Tom Quayle, Guthrie Govan that I see on YouTube or have been lucky enough to meet. Um, and so it's great when you see people, sometimes your peers benefit from all that stuff. Um, and again, some of it is also just how reactive I've been able to be, I think, doing all sorts of weird gigs. I'm quite proud of where I'm at in terms of musicianship, I think. I'm able to do a lot of stuff. So it's a big mixture of things. I didn't really give you a single answer, did I? <laughs> Have you got a mentor or had a mentor? Uh, I've always had great teachers. Um, so when I was first learning guitar, there was a guitarist called Mark Thomas who lived just down the road from my parents' house at the time, and he was he still is a fantastic guitarist and teacher. And the the difference in my learning with him compared to the slightly more classical route I'd gone through with saxophone was really stark. So I remember the first lesson I had with him, it was like, what do you want to learn? What songs do you like? Which artists do you like? And it was just like, oh man, uh, I like these guys. And it was like, cool, we'll learn some of that. And it was this freedom of learn what you want because you think it sounds cool. Um, and, you know, he's one of those guys that uh, his teaching style inspired me massively. I tried to emulate his teaching as much as I could because I enjoyed it so much. Um, he would listen to 10 seconds of an artist that I'd requested and be like, sweet, okay, I think I've got it. Here's the chords. And it was just like, oh, my God, what is going on? This is literally like magic. Like, I didn't know what was happening because I'd never been taught about relative pitch, about using your ears, about ear training. Um, and he was just on it. It was amazing. And so I could go there. And it got to the point where I was trying to challenge him with like, I want to learn Ying V. Malmsteen stuff, even though I knew it would be a million years till I could play it at that point. Um, and he'd be like, okay, man. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Obviously, he'd have some of it transcribed. He'd work out some of it. He could slow some of it down, and we could both listen to it together. And the other thing that was great about him was he used to set up gigs. So that was a massive deal. for. Imagine being you know, 14, and you've got a gig. Um, after a year of playing guitar, he used to hire out the local community centre and uh, all the students would have a go and all the parents would be there with their little styrofoam cups of coffee and you pay 50p to get in And because he just loved it. He loved teaching, he loved um, the relationship with all the students and the parents. Um, and that was a big deal for me because it was really like starting off on the right foot. And then in ACM, same sort of thing. All those guys are fantastic teachers, still in touch with a lot of them now and they're still taking me to school whenever I meet them and we start talking about stuff. What's the best piece of advice you've been given? Um, that's another big one. Can I have two answers? Yeah, hit it. <laughs> so the best piece of advice in terms of being like a slightly hippie philosophical answer probably comes from Guthrie Govan, which I think he once said, not to me, but to YouTube at large, was um, don't focus on getting good, focus on getting better which really struck me because I think musicians are very competitive many most of the time by nature and we obsess over being like you know we were saying before about our YouTube content is there any point in posting it if I'm not the best at doing it and of course there is because it's you it's yours no one else sounds quite like you but if you feel like there's room for improvement don't beat yourself up because you're not there focus on getting there and then there, and then there, and then there, and you'll overtake all of your estimations anyway. Um, so in the terms of like a philosophical thing to bear in mind and to stop yourself from getting too sad, <laughs> I think that was really helpful because it really stopped me from obsessing over, oh, God, well, Tom Quayle's got the legato thing, and Guthrie's kind of got everything, and then there's all this with the alternate picking over here, and you can't be pulled in all those directions at once. So for me, it was just chill, enjoy what you're doing, and hopefully the skills will kind of sneak up on you and you'll sound like you rather than like this weird amalgamation of the worst bits of all your favorite guitar players. Um, and then a practical thing which um, a lot of people said to me when I was younger, but I only relatively recently in the last sort of five to seven years started properly looking into was learning the fretboard. And not just learning the notes on the fretboard, but learning how they relate to each other. And, and you said earlier about why would I play that A chord and things like that that knowledge then kind of comes to the forefront of your mind and you know what will work without having to hear it first. Um, exposing yourself to all that stuff and jamming over backing tracks and jamming over other people's music and jamming with other humans, which I don't do enough, especially now that we're all ridden with disease. Um, that's huge for me. So that's been like a real uh, practical thing. Like I can get my hands and my noggin around is learning the fretboard. That was a big one. So what's your Desert Island disc? Oh, man. I don't know. It's probably probably Dark Side of the Moon at the moment. 
And what books are you reading? Um, not enough. Uh, I've been rereading The Hobbit actually, because <laughs> uh, we watched the. F I was big into reading when I was pretty young actually, before I discovered music, and it all went to pot. Um, and I we watched the films for the third time recently, me and my girlfriend, and I sort of decided this isn't right. I'm going to read the books again, and so kind of been working my way through that. But also been reading a bit of Cloud Atlas. Um, I'm supposed to be reading loads of stuff about music theory and like jazz theory books, but they're not exactly, you know, a, a toilet seat read. And you got any other hobbies? Uh, mostly video games. <laughs> my life is pretty much split between guitar and video games most of the time. So where did you fit your um, girlfriend in? Um, I, I mean, she's all right. She's fine. <laughs> <laughs> She plays video games as well, luckily, so we oh. have some mutual bonding over that. All right, so it's like 50% guitar, like 40% video games, and then like 10% we'll sit down and watch Netflix, maybe. Uh, you're in trouble later. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you got any favourite quotes in life? Um, ooh, good question. I have one, but uh, it's not anything to do with music. It doesn't have to be. What is it? It's linked to a favourite memory that I have. Um, I think it's Mark Twain that said, golf is a good walk spoiled. And I used to wind my dad up because my dad plays golf. And I used to remind him of that quote all the time. And I was working with Emma at one point. We were doing a gig. And she introduced some guy to me saying, oh, this is blur de blur de blur, as if I should know who he is. And said, tell him that quote that you like from Mark Twain about golf. And I said, oh, you'll love this, whoever you are. I don't know who you are. Uh, but I feel clever, so here's a quote from Mark Twain. Golf is a good walk spoiled. And he was like, brilliant, I'm a professional golfer. You might have heard of me. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was awkward. Uh, just shows how little I know about the golfing world. Um, and Emma loved it because she dropped me right in it. But um, that was that cemented it as a favourite quote. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any favourite podcasts you listen to? I listen to Last Podcast on the Left a lot, um, which is a really good, like... Um, how to describe it? They there are three guys who just joke and laugh about uh, research into conspiracies and true crime, um, things like that. Alien abductions. I sound like a right kook, but it's funny. Like it's they take the mick out of everything, um, and they're just three kind of funny dudes that talk about all this crazy stuff. They've talked about all sorts of insane conspiracies and put a weird spin on it and take the mick out of all these subjects, which I really like. And I'm a big subscriber to the Guitar Hour as well, which is um. Tom Quayle, David Beebe, Dan Smith, Jake Wilson, um, who I have a subscribe to their Patreon as well, and it's just like unlimited guitar goodness. Um, these guys who are at the top of their game talking about theory, tone, techniques, gear, um, and every couple of weeks, if you're a Patreon, you they do like a live stream where you can ask questions and you see them play. And these these guys are you know apex predators of guitar, so it's really cool to be able to talk to them kind of one-on-one -on -one in a, or at least, you know, six-on-one as the case may be with all this stuff. Um, and good for listening to if you're on your way to a gig and you're nervous about theory, you can try and <laughs> cram it in as much as possible. And what are you watching on TV? Netflix? Yeah, so I've been, I've actually, so the lockdown situation has been pretty interesting because I've consumed quite a lot <laughs> of TV. Um, I'm watching Futurama again for the first time since I was a kid, which has been solid gold. Um, and also I'm watching House for the third time because I'm afraid of new things, so why change? Right, so do you have a, a method for creating your chord melodies? I think we covered a little bit of it earlier. Um, yeah, so we're talking about kind of knowing where I am in the key and things like that. The answer is yes, but it rarely actually works musically. What I tend to start with would be a chord. So if I, again, if I was in A... <laughs> I often find that if I then behave myself and I go, all right, well, I'm in A, so I'm allowed to use, like, D. And then maybe B minor. And I'm thinking, I know my chords in the key of A, and I can work them out if I get stuck. But what I find then is I just sound like a dude practicing the key of A. Um, and I think there's a real rift between writing music because you know how and writing music because you're enjoying how it sounds. So a lot of my favorite chord progressions that I've written have actually been more like... I'm not allowed to use this chord. And you get weirder sounds. And then when it comes to chord melodies, soloing over the top and using uh, improvisational knowledge, kind of comes down to, right, the first chord was A. That has 
a 1, a 3, a 5 in it, knowing the fretboard, knowing my intervals and knowing the shapes for those intervals. So I might quickly try and go over the A. The next chord was really weird. It was B flat major 7. And so all of a sudden, trying to loop that back around to an A becomes a bit of a challenge. And I've got to play really safe, knowing... Well, not safe, but I've got to play by the rules to an extent, knowing what notes are in that chord and knowing what's allowed and what's not allowed. Could talk for hours about this because it's one of those weird things that guitarists often don't avoid, but um, it's not that present in you know pop and rock guitar playing necessarily. That's probably a bit of an unfair statement. Um, but we joked earlier about how most guitarists are like, right, cool. <laughs> And you can play the minor pentonic, but then you get presented with this weird chord that doesn't quite fit, and it's like, oh, I'm just going to keep going. And it's just like, eventually it'll come back around, I promise. Um, that was a big deal for me, was trying to cope with weird chords, and so I try to really use that knowledge practically when I'm writing. My so over program, that chord then, so you, what was you thinking? Was you doing chromatic or...? Yeah, a little bit. So it's, it's all a big um, mush of things joining together. So over that A chord, I think I played something like that, where I'm thinking, that's the one, that's the three, which I slid into to give it that slightly spicy sound. That's the five. So all those are chord tones. And then that's a kind of pentatonic -y lick, which I've just literally pulled out of the lick bag. Um, so now I've ended up with something like that, which even without hearing the chord, hopefully a listener might hear and you've got that cheesy kind of uh, vibe. Um, and then when the chord was weird, if I do have to cope with a weird chord, you sort of have to reset and you can't think of the same things again. If I was staying in a sensible chord progression, which most normal, sensible, non-masochistic humans would do, they could use the same lick again and it would still sound great. But if you're presented with something wacky, which usually catches your ear, I then have to think, oh, okay, I'm now over B flat major and I've got the same intervals but in a different place. So everything's moved up a fret. And then when it goes back to A, I have to try and find those A notes again. So hopefully what we've heard is that really wacky chord progression. If I was being a bit more sensible, it might be like A, F sharp minor, A, or something, which would be much more manageable. Which is a little bit more... Melodic, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> do you have a favourite chord? Oh, yeah, I do. So this is my favourite chord. <laughs> Very pretty chord. What's it called? Uh, you with the questions. <laughs> no, I would see that as an A major 9 sharp 11 with no third. Um, and you get that really like dreamy kind of wobbly sound out of it. Do you have like any fancy scales over like a G9? That you'd throw out there. Any fancy oh, scale over a G9? Yeah, or, oh, or man. for a soloing, you know, for blues, because obviously that's my background. Yeah, so if I was playing over like a G9 in a blues context, if we were like... I would probably be kind of... That's pretty much G minor pentatonic, and like the G blues scale, so there's a lot of that... But where the blues gets interesting for me, and I actually find the blues to be, and I'm sure you, uh, you know, love this stuff as well. Um, it's hard to play over well. Like the guys that are really good at blues are just on another level. It's it's like they say all this stuff and they really know their stuff, but they manage to do it with so much conviction and feel. Um, and being a pasty white dude from Surrey isn't exactly like. I wasn't born into the blues, <laughs> like, exactly. So I, I tend to overthink things. And then when the chord changes to like the C9 in a blues, I then might carry on playing G minor pentonic, which is what a lot of blues guys might do. But I get carried away and I start thinking, oh, I could use the Lydian dominant scale and ruin my chances at this gig. And it stops sounding cool and starts sounding nerdy. So I really struggle with that. Like, I've, I've come across so much information and tried to absorb it so much because I'm a dweeb that I then struggle with not ruining it. <laughs> um, what I would do if I was having a good day is probably play G minor pentatonic all day long. 
And it would probably work pretty well. And what about sort of going to the five then? So like an E7 sharp nine in an A? So if we were in A and we had... And then we came across that, like the Hendrix E chord. Yeah. Again, I would probably overthink it and I would play like an E altered lick. Which um, what's that then? So I might play... That sort of thing. But the sensible part of me, which now these days makes up about 3% of my brain, would probably say A minor pentatonic all day long. Um, most... I mean, I've chatted with guys like Tom Quayle about this because obviously Tom Quayle is not necessarily known as a blues player, but he knows his stuff. Like he's, like I said, he's kind of the apex predator of a lot of this theory knowledge. Um, I remember having a conversation with him once saying, yeah, you can use all this crazy stuff, but if you're playing over a blues and you've got like... You haven't got much time. There's not much point going, scuba, oh crap, I've run out of time on that chord. And the problem with a lot of these more complicated, tense sounding ideas is that if you don't land well, <laughs> you've just played a bunch of terribly wrong notes. It's all about how you land that stuff. So what I remember him telling me once, which was great advice, is don't try and force all this stuff into a blues if this will work just as well. Like minor pentatonic, again, would work great. Um, it depends on the blues. So sometimes you might have that. You've got so much more time to uh, go for it. And I struggle with that because I struggle with the less is more thing. Do you have any arpeggio patterns that you can throw out there? Yes. Um, funny you should say that. I've been working a lot on arpeggios recently, and that's been one of the things that's changed in my playing. Because um, I mentioned that I've done all this paying attention to intervals and things, and of course arpeggios are intervals in a chord bundled together in a shape. Um, if you're familiar with Rick Graham um, as an absolute fiend on guitar, he this was ages ago, this might be like a year or more ago, he did a video on YouTube called Pedals Are Amazing, in which he was talking about this lick he was doing up here, but just to take the mick, he started playing these arpeggio lines down here as well, and I think the one he played was that sort of thing, like this real neoclassical thing, and so what he's doing is playing a G7 arpeggio, but breaking it up in this like kind of almost harpsichord-esque way, um, he's such a savage, it's ridiculous, that's taken me a year, <laughs> just because the technique is so awkward and so un-guitar like, um, but I was obsessed with the sound. Um, and then he does another one and I haven't gotten to that bit yet. But um, I'm really enjoying a lot of the arpeggio stuff uh, where if you were playing over like that G, I might have um, lots of the, I've played lots of arpeggios where I'm visualizing an arpeggio shape, but I will fill the gaps in with nonsense. Absolute bollocks. Chromatic. Just like, yeah. Mm. So if I landed at the wrong time, it sounds hilarious because you're hurting people with that terrible noise. But if you land on, like we were saying earlier, like the chord tones, the ones, etc., the threes, the fives, you might have, and you get away with it because it sort of suddenly lands back in the correct category. Um, I find that stuff really fascinating, and it's probably bad that I test that stuff out quite a lot on gigs. <laughs> so if, you, if it lands badly, the whole lick is bad. But if the whole lick is bad, but it lands well, you totally get away with it. I'm going to ask you a few quick fire questions. Okay, I'll try my best. Right, so silence or conversation? Oh, it depends who it's with. <laughs> minor or major? Uh, minor. Vocals or instrumental? Depends on the vocalist, but vocals. <laughs> <laughs> Morning or night? Uh, night. Love or money? Oh, love, definitely. Gumphrey Govan or Bradley Paisley? Oh my God, what? Um, I'm going to go Brad Paisley. <laughs> What's the first thing you grab in the morning? Um, peanut butter. On toast? Yeah. The food of kings. Do you like Marmite? 
Yeah. Cool. <laughs> oh, mate, we've been trying it. We've got in the flat right now. Marmite peanut butter. Outrageous. What? Get it in your life. I know. It shouldn't work, but it does. What, you bought it? Cool. Yeah, it's, it's a real thing. Yeah, we didn't make you imagine we make it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of that. Marmite peanut butter. Yeah, it's a real thing, I promise. I'm not mental. Oh, shit. Lordy, lordy. <laughs> Right, and another thing I was going to try and do, so I was going to pick a, either a general knowledge or film round. Oh, man. Oh, I'm bad at this stuff. When we when lockdown first started, me and my family used to do, like, Skype quiz nights. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. trash. Um, let's go films. Films, all right. Which iconic film has the phrase, follow the white rabbit? Oh, Alice in Wonderland. Or is it The Matrix? Hey, ding. Which 80s film has the character Ducky in it? Uh, you might be too young for that. I might be. It sounds familiar. You'll have to let me know. Pretty in Pink. Oh, I wouldn't have gotten that. <laughs> uh, let's find one more. <laughs> Try and find one that you might know. They're all pretty 80s, actually. I mean, you a James Bond fan? Apparently not. I'm not sure what that is. What, oh, ja- sorry. Did you say James Bond? Yeah. Oh, imagine if I actually said that as a real answer. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Um, not massively. All right. Let's pick a music one then. Let's go up there. What year did Nirvana f- frontman Kurt Cobain die? Oh, I should know this. I don't know. Ni- 1994. That was one of the podcast episodes I listened to from last podcast on the left. They talk about his death and all the mystery surrounding it. So I definitely should know that. Yeah, so that's that's well then. You remembered that. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely sinking in. <laughs> now it's been a real pleasure, Sam, uh, talking with you and getting Same to know here. you. It's been great. Getting to know you better. And yourself. Um, obviously, people can go to your website to find out about your, your guitar courses, your teachings. Um, yeah. So www.stwmusic.co.uk. I'll put a link at the end. Nice one. Thank you. Um, you're also on Instagram, Facebook. Are they the yeah. are they, What names are you on? For them so i'm on most stuff like that i'm sam t whiting sam t whiting okay so yeah been a real pleasure thank you very much nice one dude great to chat to you thanks for reaching out <laughs> see you soon nice one dude take care hey it's tommy allen from tommyallenmusic.com and that was sam whiting you can find out more about him and his music at www.stwmusic.co.uk Next week, we have Stephen Steinhouse. He's a teacher. He's a performer. He's the MC at the Upton Blues Festival, and he's right here on Tommy Allen Music next Wednesday at 7 p.m. If you like what we're doing, please give us a like, hit the subscribe button. But until next week, a word from our director.